is hidden away in a wall of Edessa, Turkey, because um, the son of the first king, who was uh, evangelized by the shroud, uh, turned into a pagan, and they had to hide it from him. So they all died off, and 500 years later, by accident, it was discovered, but it was herme almost hermetically sealed in that wall. Okay? So what happens in 525, we think, is that they finally recovered the shroud and started looking at it, and the artists of the time passed on the tradition of this appearance of God. So that is about Jesus. Now, I just stepped outside of my science, and I called him Jesus. The man of the shroud, excuse me. All right. Here's a points of congruence. That means when you get the image of the face of the shroud, and you overlay it digitally over this painting, the Pantocrator, which was painted in 550 AD, the image shows exactly congruence. Congruence means the distance between eyes to nose, eyes to eye, eyes to mouth, nose to mouth. If you take all those distances, it exactly matches the proportion of the uh, shroud itself. This is the shroud, and this is the uh, painting. So you can see that is 120 points of congruence. To convict somebody to court a law, you need 45 points of congruence to match a picture of one on another to say somebody is potentially guilty. All right? So it's kind of unusual and kind of at least for me, I'm convinced that this matches up pretty good. Somebody was looking at the shroud when he painted this picture in 550 AD. It wasn't carbon dated. The carbon dated said it was 1260. That's way before 1260. All right? Now we go to Constantinople. Now, there is in Hungary a, a, a Bible with a painting on the front. And to show you what was going on at that time, somebody painted this picture. And this picture carbon dates to 1196. All right? Now, in this picture, we have the preparation of the body on uh, Friday. And you can see, again, that he's nude. He has his arms crossed. He has long hair. And particularly, we're going to look at detail, he has no thumbs. No thumbs. Why would an artist paint somebody with no thumbs? Down here, we have Easter Sunday. We have the, the, the uh, women coming in to anoint him. We have what's called herringbone tweed, like a herringbone jacket. That's the pattern of the shroud. And I'm going to show you in detail now this other thing. So here's the first details. So long hair, beard, nude, crossed arms, just like the shroud, and missing thumbs. Second, close-up, herringbone tweed, and most important, four burn holes in the shape of an L. On the shroud, in two places, there are four burn holes. This is the real shroud L-shaped burn holes. This is the painting's burn holes. You see the herringbone weave and the four burn holes. All right? So now we have a person who created this in the medieval times as a fake, had to make this out of thin air, that the man had no thumbs, crossed arms, nude, long hair, uh, herringbone tweed, and had four dots on it in the shape of an L. He had to invent that out of the clear blue sky. That did not happen in my opinion. All right, documented evidence. It ends up now in Lyre, France, then it's Chambéry, then it's Turin. Okay, now it's been transferred to the ownership of the Vatican, but this is gonna be surprising. It only got transfer transferred to ownership in 1985. The kings of Savoy, the Savoy family owned it uh, for over 400 years. And now it's inside this uh, uh, holding place, which is a steel argon gas uh, creation to keep it from uh, deteriorating or oxidizing from the atmosphere. And this is a Turin cathedral. Now, the new pope, in my opinion, loves the shroud. Why do I say that? Because 2010, we went to see it. The next exposition was supposed to be 2025. Well, when he became pope, he automatically, four months ago, said, we're going to have an exposition. And it's going to be April 2015. So he jumped the circuit by 10 years. Why would he do that? Because he thinks it's an extremely important thing to bring out we have this, and it will help evangelize um, the, the church and the faith. So, so the new pope, I think, really loves the shroud and truly believes it. Now, the, the Catholic Church has never been able to say that this is authentically the shroud of Turin. And they shouldn't, and I'm going to tell you why when I tell you that last point at the end. All right. Now we're going to zip into the physical science. In 1898, the first scientific thing happens. Somebody takes a picture. All right. All right. This is a picture taken in 1898. Now, what it is, is actually a photographic negative. So, if you don't know what that is, because you're all pretty young, in the good old days, we'd take pictures, we'd take it into a drugstore, we turn the film in, we get back a positive print, we would look light, the background would be dark, the negative would show a dark image of us and a light background. So, I guess you don't know what that is. All right, but anyway, this is a dark image, and this is a light background. So, this is hard to see. It's like ethereal, it's not quite here. All right? So that is the uh, picture itself, the characteristics of a negative. So what does Secunda Pia, the photographer, do? He took it back to the dark room, 
How many heard of dark room? Oh my gosh, you typed the dark room. All right, so when you type in the dark room, you do a negative of a negative, and you get a positive when you do a negative of a negative. So here's the positive. The positive is more reality, and is overwhelming difference between this image and this image, as you can see, right? All right, you got long hair, you got blood in hair, you got teeth, two rows of teeth. Can you appreciate the teeth? Looks look like dental x-rays, look at that. Maybe you can in the front. Some of you can? Okay. All right, and they used to, what's a forked beard, mustache, you can appreciate the nose and the deep set eyes. All right, now this is a picture of 1931, so it's a, it's a better camera resolution. So now you have more details of the hair, and also you can appreciate he has no ears and no cheeks. And I'm gonna tell you why, because we know now in 2014 why. And he has a, a, a distended abdomen. That's what happens when a person dies of this asphyxia. That's how he died. Uh, he has an overexpanded chest where he took his last breath in. So in, this, in the crucifixion and death scene, physiologically, you have trouble blowing air out, not bringing it in. So his last breath was in. He couldn't get the air out. Here's gravity force pouring blood going down his arm, and here's a big clump of blood on his wrist. Now this gravity position, by many physicians that have studied this, show the draining that would happen if your arms are in this position. All right, so it totally fits, fits, fits the story of coming down the arm. You see the details that I'm telling you that would be pretty hard to take. All right, here's the back of the man in the shroud. He has a long ponytail. He has fluffy, hair blower, dry hair. That's the feeling I get. I don't get the feeling of matted, sticky, uh, sweating hair all sticking to the sides of his face. It looks like he took out a hair blower. So he's got a ponytail, hair blower hair. There's the L-shaped burn holes. His knees are pulled up. So when he died, he hung on the cross for two hours. And he died like this. So his, I can't lace, sorry, I can't raise two legs. So the, the knees were pulled up. And then in that position, he froze and rigor mortis because he was there, we think, for about two hours while Joseph Arimathema got permission to take the, cross, to take the body off the cross. You can see pool blood coming out of the right side where a spear, uh, according to the Bible, went in and the blood is, is, is passing along his back. And remember, you're looking at um, the body down on a, like he's laying on a glass table and you're underneath looking through the glass. So the blood is pooling and then running across his back. All right, real science starts in 1976. Now, the credit for the real science on the shroud, and I am proud to say, is NASA. The United States of America, NASA, we get the credit for doing this, all right? Why do we get the credit? Because one of the professors of physics at the United States Air Force Academy uh, uh, got a picture of the shroud and put it under the VPA image analyzer, which is part of satellites. Satellites would go to the moon and Mars and look down at the surface take pictures that would show three-dimensional information based on the degradation of gray and black. They could figure how high a mountain was, how deep the valley was, all right? So this was used all the time by NASA, and the physics professor, John Jackson, did this, and it would show the 3D image of mountains, out of 2D information, all right? So John Jackson, 1976, put the picture under the VPA image analyzer, and he got a 3D picture. Are you not impressed? All right, that's a 3D picture, all right? So here's a 3D picture of the whole body, head, chest, arms, all right? And here is what happens when a normal picture, not the shroud, this girl, is, her picture is put under the VPA image analyzer, you get scrambled eggs. Here's what happens when you submit it, as they did in 2005, to digital cutting hologram formation. So actually in the shroud picture itself, what, what, is, what Secundipi took, is 3D hologram information that does not exist in other two-dimensional pictures that we all deal with every day in life. You don't find any pictures with 3D encoded information. All right, that's hard to figure out also. All right, now, because of the 3D image, the Vatican was quite impressed with American science, thinking that we'd finally evolved to the point where we knew what we were doing, and we could be trusted to exactly touch the shroud and examine it and see what, why the image was there, what was going on. So they formed a team in 1978. These are American scientists. The scientists were 40 of them from Los Alamos, NASA, Air Force Academy, Jet Propulsion Lab, who represented all these disciplines of science. All right, now, what was their belief? Interesting. 38 were agnostics, scientists. 38 agnostic scientists. Two were still believers. 
three raised Catholic, 36 raised Protestant, one Orthodox Jew. At the time they went to Italy, they thought they were going to have a good Italian food, have a good time, come back and save the Shroud's faith. When they all left, they did not say that the Shroud of Turin was authentically the bearer of the cross of Christ. They said it is not a fake. We know what it isn't. It's not a fake. That's what they all said to the men. All right, these are the tests that this team did. Photomicroscopy, infrared reflectance spectroscopy, scanning UV light photography, infrared imaging, low energy X-ray, X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, spectrometry, particle analysis, blood analysis, microchemical analysis. Right? So we're not talking about a little picture.